Oh, it's in our jewelry from a corporation. No, we don't buy them from individuals anymore. We don't go to the craftsman. We don't go to the farmer. We don't go to the person who produces the value. We go to some corporation. And guess who makes the profit on the sale? Not the person who made the, the jewelry, but the corporation that markets the jewelry. See? Not the farmer who grew the food with his hard work, but the corporation that distributes it. They make all the profit. What were we looking at? Potatoes? One time we looked into potatoes. The potatoes cost about $5 a kilo or something like that at the store. But how much does the farmer get? About 14 cents for the, kilo, the same kilo of potatoes. So who's making all the money? All the distributors, the retailers. And, see, all these artificial corporations between the person and the, the producer uh, and the consumer. So there's only so long you can go on with this. After a while, you have sucked all the value, all the wealth out of the workers, and they don't have anything anymore. You can't get any more. See? So the 20% the of the world's population that lives in the U.S. and Europe, Western Europe, uses something like, I don't know, 80% of the value in the world, produced in the world by people's labor. Everybody else is very, very poor in comparison. So uh, what happens when those people finally are reduced to complete poverty? Well, guess what? The whole system breaks down. If you can't exploit people anymore, if you can't steal from them, if you can't rip off their wealth anymore and export it from some, to some other place, then your company can't make a profit anymore because that's the way it's set up. That's the way it's optimized. So this is what's happening in the world today. This is what they don't tell you on the news when they, when they talk about, oh, the stock market's going down and there's a credit crunch and this and that. The real cause is the system itself. The real cause is the, the corporate structure itself. This happens every so often. When was the last one? 1939 uh, to 2009, 80 years ago. About every 80 years, the whole system cracks up. And this time, it's going to be really bad because we're also on the edge of environmental collapse. Uh, if the temperature of the world goes up only four degrees centigrade, then you're going to see the whole equatorial belt is going to become uninhabitable. Why? Because the rain will stop. You need a uh, clash of warm, moist air with cool, dry air to form rain. So if the dry, cool air gets heated up, it won't make rain. So if it, all, there, all there has to be is a temperature of 4 degrees centigrade increase. And that could happen any time. So we're thinking there's probably going to be a, uh, uh, a big increase in the temperature. Uh, we're going to pass a tipping point, And that this is going to happen much, much sooner and much faster than most of the scientists think. That's why we're moving to southern Chile. <laughs> Prabhupada one time said that uh, Canada would become like semi-tropical, like Florida. So there's only two things that could cause that. Either the Earth's axis tilts, or the, rather to state it more scientifically, the lithosphere of the Earth changes its orientation with re regard to the core. Or, the other possibility is, global warming. And the uh, expansion of the, of the tropical band uh, because of the general warming of the whole planet. So it seems like the latter is what's actually happening. Uh, we have some evidence that this is going on. We don't have any evidence that there's 
uh, shift of the Earth's crust yet. I mean, the, the North Pole has been wandering quite a bit more than normal. Both the, uh, the rotational pole and the magnetic pole are moving quite a bit more than they do normally. And um, we don't know if that is foreshadowing some other changes. Um, but the evidence that we do have is that global warming is taking place. So we have to assume that it's going to just continue and it's going to get worse. So that means either we move to Canada or we move to uh, uh, southern part of the world. And the southern part of the world is preferable because even if there is uh, a big problem in the north, it won't affect us down here. See, like it looks like now there's uh, going to be some kind of a border problem between the U.S. and Mexico. This is one reason why we got out of Mexico. Because we saw that the living conditions in Mexico were becoming very difficult. The crime especially is increasing more and more. And uh, at some point, I think the gangs in Mexico are going to start targeting foreigners. So we didn't feel like we had a long-term safe situation in Mexico. But in Chile, there's no problems like that. Very, very low crime rate. Uh, Chile is a very law-abiding society. Of all of the countries in Latin America, Spanish-speaking countries, uh, Chile is the most law-abiding country. You can't, you can't bribe the police here. It's like, don't even try. Uh, whereas everywhere else, you, you have to bribe the police. It's just a part of doing business, a normal thing. So we can understand that uh, Chile has certain advantages over other countries in the world. Uh, it also has a climactic advantage because uh, you can select your climate. If you like hot desert, you go to the north of Chile. Uh, if you like rain all the time, then you go to extreme southern Chile. And it's cold and rainy all the time. So we like a little bit sort of in between where it's warm, but not too hot, and where you get enough rain for good farming, but not so much rain that it's cloudy all the time and like that. So uh, that's the first criterion. And the next criterion that we want uh, for a long-term situation is good farming. So of course the best farm comes from uh, volcanic soil. And guess what? Chile has some very nice volcanic areas. Uh, it even has active volcanoes. There are two of them. Uh, one in Villa Rica and another one further down south. I forget the name of it. But it's so far down south that it's very cold there and we don't want to be there. So where we're going is the area of the Villa Rica volcano. And uh, it's also a tourist area. It's very pretty. There is a lot of um, nature preserves and like that. Super hiking, uh, super uh, rafting, and, and that like. There's a lot of rivers there. So a lot of people go there for adventure tourism, for hiking, for rafting, even hunting and fishing and like that. Uh, so we don't want to be, of course, right in the middle of a tourist area. But there are places like on the edge you know, where we could be like near to a town and also near to a national park in really good farmland and close to the volcano, but not so close that we would be in danger in the case of an eruption. So once, uh, once we get there, we're going to scout out the area and uh, see where we want to be located. And, well, I can't say yet because we're not there. But it looks to me like we probably want to be a little bit uh, down from the lake region and that way we can be near a stream, we can have a local source of water and we can have really rich farmland and like that. So uh, that's why we're headed towards Villa Rica. We're going to rent a cottage right on the lake and use that as our base of explorations. So I am so ready to be out of the city, <laughs> I'll tell you. 
But, you know, uh, it's good that we stayed here and we worked hard and we finished up so much that we had to do and uh, now can take some time to look around the country and see what's really out there. We want to start from uh, Brahmachari Ashram. Brahmachari Ashram means um, like a monastery for celibate students. Um, because I'm, I'm in the renounced order of life, and so it's natural that my students will also be like that. But in the future, once we're established, we also want to invite householders. Uh, once we have the facility, for example, the, the main reason why we made a corporation is, well, because we get tax deduction 